the truth, the life. So, Father, we thank you. And, Father, we love you. In your precious son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, River of Grace. Um, have you ever had those moments where you've thought to yourself that, well, you know better? Like you've read some instructions or, you know, if you're a man in the room that just throws the instructions away when you open the box. Like, like there's a, a part of you that says, well, I just, I just know better. Well, there were a couple of weeks ago where I had this moment where I thought to myself while I was cooking dinner, and yes, I, I do cook dinner and enjoy cooking dinner. And uh, if you think I need to hand over my man card, let me just tell you, I've got a healthy marriage because I know how to cook dinner. Um, and... And in that, I thought to myself, in the recipe that I was cooking, it, did, it called for heavy whipping cream. And I realized I didn't have any, but I was already in the midst of making this meal. And, and I thought to myself, well, heavy whipping cream, all it is, is just, well, a condensed milk. And what I realized I did have was sweetened condensed milk. And there are some of you that have no idea what that means, and others are like, no, you didn't. Well, yes, I did. And let me just say, it didn't turn out quite the way I anticipated. A couple of years ago, I had the same thought while working out in the yard. I had run over to Ace to grab some fertilizer, and I got home, and I thought to myself, my backyard has got, well, a few more weeds than, than I would like. So maybe it needs a little more fertilizer than what the, well, the bag calls for. When you double up on fertilizer, that's not a good thing. And in the next week or two, I had all these scorched patches of grass everywhere on my yard. And I'm thinking to myself, I gave it what it needed. And yet, if I had just followed the instructions, um, there would have been a different result. And I really think that's the story of mankind in so many ways that we're recovering from Genesis chapter 3. That from Genesis chapter 3 on, we see moment after moment after moment after moment where people on an individual level as well as a, a global level trying to recover from the consequences of sin that entered the picture in Genesis chapter 3. And page after page, you, you can see it in, in Cain and Abel and, and Samson and David and Moses and Jonah, like, like story and moment and page after page in Scripture people trying to recover from Genesis chapter 3 without God, without him being part of it. And so today I want to walk through what I think are two different perspectives on how you and I, we live our life and what it looks like to understand our way versus his way. If you're taking notes with me this morning, I would just point out that number one, right out of the gate today, that we live our life our way, out of our strength. There are so many instances that I can think of in ministry where this comes to fruition, but one that jumps out to me is a former student who, who told me that he thought his dad, he, he would do him a favor. And his dad had loaned him the keys to his truck, and so he wanted to do his dad a favor, and he thought his dad drove a big boy truck and needed big boy gas. So he decided to put diesel in his dad's truck because he thought that was doing his dad a favor. But he didn't need diesel in his truck. He needed unleaded in his truck. And, and, and it's in these moments where we think we, we know better. And, well, there's no better place in Scripture for me to look at this morning to help us understand this than Genesis chapter 11. If you have your Bible, I invite you to look with me there beginning in verse 1 today. And if you don't own a Bible, I'd love to give you a free gift of God's Word today. And the following service, you can make your way to our next steps booth in the back and just let them know you'd like a copy of God's Word. I'd love to give you one. Uh, but here in Genesis chapter 11, you can follow along on our screens or in your word. And it says in verse 1, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitmuin for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be di dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Now again, understand, this is, this is born out of Genesis chapter 3. And this is what it looks like, again, for 
this, this story to unravel from chapter three in this attempt to resolve or recover from three. And just realize that, that in our attempt, there, there's no greater evidence of this than to just look in one page from Genesis chapter three to Genesis chapter four. In three, seeing Adam and Eve walking in intimacy with God in the cool of the morning in the garden to in one chapter in the first generation of humanity. We move from intimacy with God, sin enters the picture, and in the first generation, we see a story demonstrating self-righteousness that ends in the first murder recorded in humanity. Like, understand, this is not some slow burn. This is a result of sin that mankind has tried to resolve or recover from. And yet later in Genesis chapter 6, we see it on a global level, right? We see the story of Noah and, and what the world's attempt had been up to that point to recover from Genesis chapter 3. And, and now we see this, well, wholesale slaughter of humanity. Now, let me, let me help you with something that if there's someone here today, as I know there probably is, or you're online with us today, you may be saying, that, 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 that pastor right there, that, that's for the reason I can't believe in your God. Look, what kind of God would, would allow this wholesale slaughter you speak of? How, what kind of God would allow genocide to happen? Recognize if you go back in the Old Testament and you examine each and every moment where recorded in history is the slaughter, if we say, of a nation, of a people. Every moment of those moments of judgment are in direct proportion to their moral depravity. Hear me. It's not because God did not send them a prophet or send them the testimony of his people. It's not that God had not tried to bring a redemption. No, that result of a mass genocide is in direct proportion to their moral depravity. And so what we see in Genesis chapter 7 and chapter 6 is, is the story of God dealing with that moral depravity in a way that says, look how far you've come apart from me. And now we see the story in Genesis chapter 11. And I realize that the story in Genesis chapter 11 is not a story that condemns building beautiful things. Like if you're in construction here today and you're kind of like sinking down in your seat, like <laughs> maybe I shouldn't be building things. That's really not at all what it's speaking of. It's a story about arrogance and, and what arrogance does. And it, and it starts out with a society just deciding to do their own thing their own way. And how do we know this? We'll look at verse two. And as people migrated from the east, they found the plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. You say, well, what does that tell me? What does that mean? Well, understand any time in the book of Genesis where you see people moving east, you recognize that is a movement away from God. So what happened with Adam and Eve? They went east out of the Garden of Eden, right? Uh, when you look at Cain after he slaughters Abel, he moves east he, he moves away from where he understood the presence of God to be. And, and now we see again this intentionality of a people moving eastward. What are they doing? Hey, we're, we're going to go do this thing on our own, our way. And it says, and they, they head to the plain of Shinar and recognize this is where many historians believe is the beginning of the city of Babylon. And recognize the word Babylon in the Hebrew means chaos or confusion. And I'm going to break that down a little bit more for us in a moment. But there's, there's an interesting statement here I want you to see that says, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they figure out how to make bricks. And, and they talk about the intentionality of doing something thoroughly. And, and why would you say that's a big deal? Because as you recognize in the future as God works with his people and you look at the construction of Jerusalem, there's an intentional instruction to build with stone. And what happens here is you see people doing something thoroughly, which just tells me that there's an instance here that I think are multiple. Uh, it's kind of some sarcasm. It's, it's alluding to a, 
the author's pointing to the fact they don't know what they don't know. Um, and let me just say, just because you know how to make a baby doesn't mean you need to be a parent. Just because they knew how to make bricks didn't, need, didn't mean they needed to build a society and a culture. They're so proud they decide to build a tower. It says, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Or a tower to the heavens. Now understand, this was a common phrase in Mesopotamia. And it's a, a phrase that would have been summed up in one word called a ziggurat. And what's a ziggurat? Well, many of us here today might see it more commonly known as like an Aztec temple. And what does an Aztec temple look like? Well, it's a mound that is built upward. And at the top of that mound, they recognize is where they have built it because it's where the God dwells. They were building their own holy mountain. See that? They, this is not a story about people that wanted to be with God. This is a story about a people that wanted to be God. Recognize it's derivative of Genesis chapter 3. What was the enemy saying? What was the serpent in the, 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 this satanic lie? You don't, you don't need to be like God. You could be God. They're still living this out. And they're so proud, they, they build this tower. And it says, and let us make a name for ourselves. This is the height of arrogance that we see in Scripture. And why does that seem like the height of arrogance? Because let recognize that how would people in the Old Testament or cultures or nations demonstrate the name for themselves? Well, we'd see it through the aspect of architecture. You don't have to go any further than the pharaohs of, of ancient civilizations. They would build images of themselves to make a name for who they were. And... They said a, a monument to us. See, that word us is a dangerous word because I think us also represents a collective I. And it's really the collective we see in Genesis chapter 3 of Adam and Eve in their desire to not be with God but to be like God. This, this desire we see lived out so clearly in Genesis 1, there in verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the faces of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said, let the light. And God said that the light was good. Now, Say, so Corey, why, why does that connect? Understand in the Hebrew, what we see here in this form or void is the same word we have for chaos. God created something good. He spoke light into the chaos and began creation out of this void, out of this chaos. Now understand, from Genesis chapter 3 on, Every time you see man or woman attempting to return or move away from God's design and move into their own intentionality, they move from what God called good in his design back into a place of chaos. It's real in your marriage. It's real in your parenting. It's real in your finances. It's real in our culture. It's real in our churches. The moment we move away from what God intended and God designed for his people, we wind up in a place of chaos. And some of you are saying, PK, why am I in this position? Like, why am I? Go back and examine God's design. He has spoken over your life, your family, your home, your marriage. It says they, they wanted to build a culture without God. What drives them to this place? Look at verse 4. Make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Why, again, is it significant? Because they don't want to be scattered. 
They don't want to be scattered over the whole earth. And why would that be concerning to you and I? Why, why would it be concerning to be scattered over the whole earth? Because that's what God said he wanted to do with them. If you go back and understand the command he gave to Adam and Eve, what was that? Well, very clearly in verse, uh, in Genesis chapter 3, they're in verses 1 through 3, but they're in verse 4. I'm sorry, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and, and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over the, every living thing that moves on the earth. And God doesn't give up on that there because remember, it's the same command he gives to Noah. That there with Noah and his family in the ark, we see the same thing that's given to him. He says, go and multiply and fill the whole earth. This is what we were created out of an expression from God to fill the earth in the midst of his creation for his glory. Fill this earth. That's who I've created you to be. And now we have a group of people that have a different plan. They don't like his plan. So out of fear of that plan, it, it drives their arrogance. And, and I think today, if we were honest about it, I think all of us in some way or another struggle with this arrogance. We struggle with God's plan. If you're honest, maybe today you've struggled with it in your own finances. Like, Pastor, I know you've been talking to us about giving and that step of obedience to give back out of God's blessing in our life. Like, like I know you, but, but Pastor, you, you, don't, you don't understand. Like, you don't know the bills that I have, and you don't know what, what I've got due in my debt, and you don't know what I've got on my credit cards, and you don't know the, the late payment bills that are sitting on my counter at my home. Like, you, you just don't know. But, but see, God does, and, and he's given you and I an understanding of obedience in that area that we say, well, I bought that boat because why I thought I knew better. I bought that car I knew I couldn't afford. Why? Because I thought I knew better. I bought a home that I knew would overextend me all because I thought I knew better. And now you find yourself in a place where you're struggling in obedience because you, you stepped outside of a design that he called you to well, manage your finances. We, we do it in our relationships, right? PK, you don't understand there's loneliness in my life and I, I want to be married. And, 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 and you don't know, I, I found this really dreamy dude. Like, like he is... He's so good looking, and you know, the only thing that's really wrong with him is he's just not a believer. And so what do you do? You flirt to convert. You, menace, you, you, you begin to missionary date. And you think to yourself, well, I can change them. Like, I, I, I know that this could ultimately be an utter train wreck, but, but, but I, I know that I can, I, can, I can fix them. I know that I can, I can save them. And, and before you know it, you've allowed your emotions to connect with someone in such a way you've moved into your own plan for your life versus that of which God has called you to be equally yoked. And you find yourself in a tragic moment. And we do it as well with our calendars. I know what I'm supposed to do with my time. I know as a believer in Christ what it looks like to have quiet time or, or be in fellowship with the body, to, to be in a life group or to be in church. And, and, and so what do we do? We now begin to vie for what we think is a better plan for our family, for our kids, with sports and hobbies and vacation. Like, like all these things we cram into our calendars, robbing us of time to simply be obedient in our gathering together. Uh, Y'all have heard me say before, I get it, life happens. But what does it look like for, for me to realize how I model obedience to my family? Uh, there was something that took place in my ministry early on where I was fortunate. Those of you that were part of Epic Camp last year, you, you got the opportunity to hear from the pastor I, I served with first in ministry. And there was something that Dr. Eric and Canner always required of us as employees when we went on vacation. And he was very clear about it. When you come back, bring me a bulletin from the church you visited on vacation. And what he was doing wasn't legalistic. He was just helping me set a priority that even if I'm not with the body of Christ here, I will choose to be with the body of Christ wherever I go. And that sets something in motion for me throughout the rest of my ministry that just placed a high value on gathering for the purpose of worshiping. Why? Because it gave me a higher value of what it meant to be in worship with the king, to seek his face. 
But I want you to see here in this passage the author's sarcasm. And this is important. Look at Genesis 11, verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of man had built. Hear me. The author is very precise here. Okay? And he uses the language intentionally. The Lord came down to their tower they were building, their holy mountain, their majestic masterpiece. This, this tower that's being erected through their ability, their power to be among the gods, God looked down. God came down. There's a sense that the author is kind of mocking them here. Again, sensing they, they don't know what they don't know. And I think just like skeptics in Scripture, or skeptics of our faith and of Scripture, what you see here in Genesis 11 is, well, what some would hold to be a contradiction in Scripture. And this is really important for those of you that might deal with skeptics or those that might oppose your faith, and it's really important that you understand how to defend your faith. And here, chapter 11 has frequently been used as a, a reason to discount the authority or legitimacy of Scripture. For example, what we read in Genesis chapter 10, it says, The coastland people spread in their lands, each with his own language, by their clans, in their nations. Why does this matter? Because see, in Genesis chapter 11, it seems to be communicating where the origin of languages comes from. Okay? But context matters. Why? Because context is everything. So if you don't understand what the writer's doing here in context, you will look at chapter 10 and chapter 11 in direct contradiction of one another. See, that's what's happening in Genesis chapter 10. The, the people's languages are being described before the Tower of Babel in, in Babel in chapter 11. See, you get to chapter 1 there, or to verse 1 of chapter 11, it says, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. Well, wait. PK, you just said in chapter 10, verse 5, the coastland people spread in their lands, each with his own language, and by their clans, in their nations. The author knows what he's doing. It's not like the author forgot what he just wrote three verses earlier from the end of chapter 10 and the beginning of chapter 11. Okay? Understand, he describes it in chapter 10, verse 5, verse 20, verse 31, and, and now we see this in Genesis 11. Now, you need to recognize that the author has not put these two stories in chronological order. What he first describes is the spread of languages in chapter 10. And in chapter 11, he's describing again its origin and that diversity. See, sometimes when you have something shocking to say, you put it at the end of your story. Sometimes you start your story with something shocking and unpack the story. So, this is important. After the flood, God said to Noah in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In chapter 10, the author describes, well, he describes that filling that multiplying of the earth. It's happening as peoples and, and languages are multiplied. It, as the author writes this, he, he's communicating in a way that would make the reader believe all they're doing in chapter 10 is being obedient to what God had told them to do after Noah. And so what does he do in chapter 11? He drops a bombshell on its reader to say, this was, has nothing to do with obedience. It had everything to do with their disobedience. They weren't spreading. What were they doing? They were clustering. God came down and, and shatters their disobedience and, and made their clustering impossible. He confused their languages. He, he, he broke humanity into many peoples in many languages. Look at verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, 
and they have all one language, and, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they p- propose to do will now be impo- to do will now be impossible for them. You read that, and at first read, at kind of a casual glance, you think to yourself, wait a minute, are they a threat to God? Like, is, is God sitting back like, whoa, whoa, like, if they keep going, like, they're going to intrude on my space. Like, they're, they're so technologically advanced. Like, they're going to creep into to my throne room. They're going to move up into my heavens. They're, they're going to they're gonna attain the presence with me. God's not sitting back, like, going, oh, me. Like, like he... He's not. No, not at all. The writer says in Genesis 11, verse 9, therefore its name was called Babel because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. This is a put down of a great city that would be known as Babylon. Hear me. It means that Babylon, in all of its vaulted towers, in all of its high walls, in all of its majesty and majestic wonder, in all of its idolatry, in all of its gardens, it's pitiful in comparison to God. The name Babel or Babylon is well, a name given to the city of the beast that we read about in Revelation chapter 14. And in this, the glory of Christ shines. Why? Because even though for a brief season, Scripture tells us that Babylon was drunk with the blood of the martyrs or the saints. Revelation 17, 6. And we go on to realize that she will be like the Tower of Babel, but be put to naught. Here's a description that marks her marks her out later as the Tower of Babel. Look at Revelation 18, verse 5, verse 7, verse 10. Her sins are heaped high as heavens. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I will sit as a queen. I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. So yes, in the last days, God will loosen his restraints that he has put on the nations. And it will swell with the pride of Babylon. Christians will suffer. And then in one instant... (laughs) Christ will come from the infinite heights. He will slay the man of lawlessness with his breath. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. And Babylon will be no more. The pride of man will be eliminated on earth. Now, if I just lost you in all of that, let me get you back. What you read about in Revelation chapter 18, well, is being foreshadowed in Genesis chapter 11. It's why you hear me say so frequently, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. What you're seeing here is a foreshadowing. A foreshadowing of that event we read about in Revelation. And in both moments, it demonstrates the might, the majesty, and victory of the king. But I want to look at number two this morning. What it looks like to describe someone who lives life in a second perspective. We allow our life to be part of God's plan around us. It's one of the reasons why you've heard me unpack that statement by Henry Blackaby that he wrote about so well back in the 80s with his writings in Experiencing God. And the premise of Experiencing God is founded in one of those, uh, in just a very simple premise. Find out where God's at work and join him. Look at verse 7 here again in Genesis 11. Come, let us go down. And there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. 
So the Lord dispersed them from over the face of all the earth, and they left off, uh, and left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. When you read that passage and you ask yourself, you know, PK, where, where is God at work in that? Well, God's kind of course correcting a people that have attempted to live life their own way. And so how does he course correct? Well, he speaks to their arrogance. And what is the only thing that speaks to our arrogance? Humility. He humbles them. God doesn't strike them down. He doesn't throw down a lightning bolt. He doesn't obliterate them. No, what does he do? He accomplishes his plan with them still. And this is one of the characteristics of God that I think people overlook when they look at this, this mean, wrath-filled, angry God that has moments where he speaks a judgment over a people, over a nation. But they fail to recognize in a moment where the people had been so arrogant, had moved so far from his design that what does he do? He, he still uses them. He uses them to further his plan. He humbles them, which again is the great remedy to arrogance, and it's humility. This, this idea that I know better is only addressed by recognizing I don't. Humility brings me back to seeking the face of the Father. To to singing a song that you sang this morning, oh God, oh God of Jacob, I seek your face. God doesn't destroy their ability to build. God doesn't destroy their creativity. God doesn't remove their their ability to, to build beautiful things. No. But what God dealt with, he dealt with the very thing that was pulling them away from him. And I think that's real for each one of us. Where is it that God needs to deal with the arrogance in my life that's made me believe my plan's better than his plan? And and if you're not careful, I've recognized in my own life when I'm unwilling to deal with that, um, God is willing to deal with that. So what does he do? He, He speaks to the area of their life, their culture, their nation, their people just like he speaks to our calendars, our relationships, our finances. When I know best, he helps me realize you don't. <laughs> PK, you, you, you think you have answers to all the questions. You don't even know all the questions. And humility, what does it say? It says, um, these things I live by, these convictions, these things I hold tightly, I hold firmly, these, these things that I believe to be self-evident, these things that I know to be, be rooted in the foundations of my life. Like, understand, these things you believe to be good and true and your obedience to them, understand, humility says, I have those things, but I hold those loosely because I recognize in the midst of holding those things loosely, God may still know better. And you might say, well, Corey, it doesn't sound like you hold conviction very dearly. I don't think that's true at all. But I just recognize over the life of ministry, over the last 28 years, God has shown me time after time after time, Corey, you still have some growing to do. And there are things that I held tightly back in ministry because, see, I came out of ministry believing with this gift, my my number one or two gifts spiritually is the gift of prophecy, which means I have a deep sense and need for justice. And the gift of prophecy is not about foretelling. People get this mixed up. Well, you're a prophet, you can see the future. No, that's not what prophecy means. Prophecy means the ability to see something that is right or wrong, and in seeing something that is wrong, having the ability or the inability to not address it because of an overwhelming sense of justice. And so what I said to myself was, Corey, you, you've got prophecy as a spiritual gift, so you must speak into these areas of brokenness in the church. Like, Corey, your mandate is to to clean out the church and and to get people who aren't living right out of the body of Christ because they don't deserve a seat in the kingdom. And and so I look like Mr. Clean when it came to the church. And I held it tightly because I'm like, well, that's the way God wired me. So what did God do? He, 
He scattered me. He tore down my towers. See, when you look in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, you recognize that in the garden, God had something that was really beautiful. And how do you say, PK, how do you know it was beautiful? Because at every moment, God said, it is good. See, anytime man gets involved, we don't have a desire to grow out with a garden. We have a desire to grow up with our towers. And so when you look at your life and you ask yourself, what do you mean a tower? Look at what it is for your name. The decisions you make, is it to make you greater? Is it to give you fame? Is it to make you noticed? Is it to give you esteem? Is it to give you power? Is it to give you... The list goes on. But see, when God said, tend the garden, he said, look, what I have created isn't about going upward, it's about going outward. And so, so often in the kingdom, you and I get wrapped up in saying, hey, we need a bigger church, we need more people. No, no, no. See, a healthy church means it goes outward, not upward. You say, well, Corey, that seems like a contradiction. It just seems like if the church is healthy, it's, it's going to go up. No, no, hear me. The church is healthy when you go out to bring people in in order for them to understand what it means for their life and, and influence to expand, not their name go up. And that's where we get it wrong in the church so often is that we're looking for churches to make names for themselves. Pastors come into conflict frequently. What church do you pastor? How, how big is your church? Yeah, I've just, I've just come up with a, a company line. It's not less than 100. It's just a little bit more. Why? Because most churches average around 100 in America. I have no desire for someone to judge me based on the size of our church. Because the moment I do, I recognize it's my tower. Oh, Corey, how big is your online audience? I don't know, and I don't care. But I want you to know you're welcome, and I'm glad you're here. Well, Corey, how many seats do you put on on Sunday? Um, you'd have to ask Onan. He works our grounds and facilities. He knows how many chairs we have. Well, well what is your attendance? And, and, and you get people wanting to understand their, their status over you based on the size of something that is so, um, so rooted in comparison. And comparison in your life and in the church is always, is always, is always deadly. You say, well, Corey, well, what do you mean I don't hold these things tightly? Like, I, I feel like I should understand there are going to be moments in your life where spiritual and scriptural principles come into conflict with one another. One of the things I appreciated about my biblical ethics professor in college was his ability to bring places of scripture that would come into conflict with one another. And he would say, it's not about choosing the good and the bad, it's choosing between the two goods. See, in Matthew chapter 12, you have a moment where Jesus is being confronted by the religious leaders. And he's teaching, and they're having a moment about Jesus attempting to heal on the Sabbath. And the religious leaders are holding tightly to an Old Testament law it says that you cannot work on the Sabbath. You, you keep the Sabbath holy. And, and their conviction is both factual and clear. And Jesus says what? If any one of you were to have a sheep that is caught in a ditch, would you not pull it out on the Sabbath? How much more should it be to heal, to do good on the Sabbath? will not take hold of it and lift it out. See, I've had so many moments where I felt like that was my task, to hold the body of Christ and lift it out of places of brokenness. And you know what I found out? And y'all have heard me say this multiple times. I found out it was such a relief when God began to show me I don't have to be his Holy Spirit. Corey, I don't need you to protect my bride. I don't need you to protect my name. I don't need you to worry about people building towers into my presence and creeping into to my arena. Like, Corey, I don't need you to guard me. I need you to be obedient. And Corey, when you're obedient, 
I'm going to do things that you could have never done in your own strength. And then today I just leave you with that question, what, what does life look like in your perspective? Is it life lived out in your way, your means, your strength, or is it life saying, Lord, I, I can't do this without you? But recognize when you come to that place of recognizing you can't do it without him, it, it demands some difficult questions for us to now say, so what has to change? What do I do about that? And let me tell you, this is the best part of today's message I get to talk about. It's really simple. Confess, repent, turn from your ways, and just move toward him. He said, Corey, you make it sound so simple. I don't think he intended for it to be hard. But Corey, do you understand all the things I'm going to have to do? Let me tell you, there are so many things he's wanting to do in you right now. But can't until you recognize whose strength you're operating in and whose plan you're working toward. He's not angry with you. He's not disappointed with you. But for many of us, he's waiting on you. He hasn't left you or abandoned you, forsaken you. He's just simply saying, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm right here where I've always been. Would you come to me? Would you find out where I'm at work and join me? Heavenly Father, this morning I, I recognize this can sit heavy on many of our hearts. Lord, I realize that we, we so easily navigate into places that look like our plan. They look like our way because, Lord, I know there's a sense of arrogance maybe with each one of us that, Lord, creeps in and, well, Father, it steals our joy. Father, it steals our ability to worship and, Father, steals our ability to see you clearly. It steals the ability to, to see your face. And so, Father, today, as we just humbly come before you, could we recognize the moments and the time and, Lord, just the need to repent change our thinking and move towards you. To take the things we've held deeply and, and firmly and Father, loosen that grip on what has been good and Father, see what is of God and be obedient to it. And so Father, this morning, we just humbly come before you asking for your guidance and your wisdom, your leadership and discernment. And Father, let us be more concerned about living in your garden versus building our towers. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. This morning, I'm going to invite you, if you would, to stand to your feet. And as you're standing today, I recognize the need for our prayer partners to step out and come forward. And as they're coming forward, I, I know each and every week there might be a different reason for you to need a prayer partner. If today the Spirit's kind of stirring your heart for a desire to know who Jesus Christ is, but we want you to know that today is the day that we believe He can transform your life. If you need to know him personally, if you say, Corey, I don't know who Jesus Christ is, just make a, your way to a prayer partner and say, can you tell me about Jesus? 